Biogeochemical cycles. Interdependence is when two or more things depend on one another in order to survive or become successful. And in this video, that's what you're going to do. You're going to obtain and evaluate and communicate how organisms rely on each other in their environment. And so we want to develop and use models of how matter is cycled throughout an entire ecosystem. We'll learn how this happens through different processes. There are really three main cycles in biology that we want to really study. The hydraulic cycle, which you might know is the water cycle, carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. These cycles represent how uh, the movement of particles and matter move through a living system and even through non-living systems. These living systems make up ecosystems. And since matter cannot be created nor destroyed, Earth is a closed system, these essential nutrients, they must continually be cycled throughout the planet. So let's jump into one that I hope you're familiar with, the water cycle. The water cycle is H2O. That's two hydrogens attached to an oxygen. Water is necessary for everything on life, uh, on life every living thing, all life on, on the planet uses water. And we find it everywhere. It's on the Earth's surface, like our oceans, our lakes, and even moving in rivers. 90% of all the water on the actual planet is contained within the ocean. So what's available for us to use is only 3% in fresh water. And of that 3%, two thirds of it, 2% of all the water on the planet, is still frozen in glaciers. So we can only use and have available to us uh, living things 1% uh, of fresh water. And under the Earth's surface is where a lot of this is. It's contained in groundwater uh, and aquifers. And then of course there's a lot up in our atmosphere. We notice and see it as clouds or humidity and it's also in organisms. So even when we eat uh, vegetables, and especially green plant matter, um, and even proteins, we do take on water from those actual materials. What drives the water cycle on our planet is the sun. The sun causes evaporation. So when we have reservoirs or uh, places where there's lots of open area and in water, um, when the sun comes out and the planet heats up, those water molecules increase in energy. They vibrate and eventually will move out of their liquid state into a gas state. And that is going to start um, the process of condensation and then precipitation and begin the water cycle. So here we have, we'll just say this is a lake also known as accumulation. When the sun rises in the morning, it starts to heat up those water molecules, they begin to evaporate. Evaporation is now driving um, the whole water movement. And water, when it gets up high enough, where it's a little cooler, it'll start to condense in the clouds, or and sorry, and form clouds in the sky. Eventually it starts to condense so much where the water molecules become closer and closer together and the clouds eventually cannot hold no longer in a gaseous state um, water. And so we see precipitation to the ground um, when enough of the volume of water is there. And then once it hits the ground, we have percolation um, and then runoff and the runoff will lead to accumulation once again. Remember I did say that it was also coming from plants, how the plants will also, when sun comes out in the morning, um, will start to transpire and drive the water cycle. So they will actually release water that they've pulled up through their root system at night and uh, release it into the atmosphere as a gaseous phase of water. So here's some of that vocabulary that we just talked about. These are just the main stages of the water cycle. Precipitation, when we have water falling from um, out of the sky to the earth as, as a liquid, we call that rain, sleet, snow. And infiltration, we wanna fill up that 1% of the water that's underground. Uh, when water hits the surface, it seeps into the underground aquifer system and uh, that's infiltrating uh, the ground. 
And then so from the surface of the earth, you know, we have what are called aquifers. These are a underground a layer of, of rock and they actually hold water almost like an underground river. <clears throat> when water first hits the surface through precipitation, we get runoff. So we get a liquid water runoff that will basically run off either into lakes and infiltrate um, surfaces, collect in bodies of water, or eventually end up infiltrating. Evaporation is the part of the cycle where liquid water turns um, from a liquid to an actual vapor. And as it's being warmed, as you would say, increasing in energy, it rises to the actual atmosphere where it is collecting. We call condensation is when water vapor condenses, becomes very, very close together. It usually has to do with the cooling of a temperature and it forms clouds and having that uh, water condensed up in the atmosphere forming clouds is a condensation. And then this happens before, you know, precipitation, before it rains. And transpiration is when water will also come back up through the atmosphere um, through through plants. They have pores underneath their leaves uh, that will release <clears throat> water vapor into the atmosphere uh, when their temperature starts to rise in the morning. So all organisms take in water for nutrient transport. They, it's how it drives chemical reactions inside of their systems. They also drive diffusion, etc. It drives a lot of different systems. So that also means that, um, you know, we have to eliminate water too. And usually organisms will do that in their excrement, urine, feces. All organisms release water when they break down food. And we call that cellular respiration. So when we um, take in carbohydrates or sugars, we use oxygen that we breathe. And out comes our products, our waste products, our carbon dioxide. That's what we breathe out. Um, and also a water product. Plants, on the other hand, they're going to take up water. So they're going to take in our waste products, carbon dioxide, and also water. And through the process of photosynthesis, they are going to create sugar and release O2 or oxygen gas. Humans have a huge impact on the water cycle. I mean, we do contribute um, only as living things. We do impact it um, in many ways. A lot of times, unfortunately, in a negative way. Um, some examples of that would be like deforestation because we're gonna lower uh, transpiration of plants if we completely remove the plant systems. We can also do things like pave roads or build things and develop things. And when we do that, we create a slick surface where water cannot infiltrate. So we would lower um, the infiltration method, which increases the runoff. And when you increase runoff, you increase pollution. When you increase that runoff, eventually it all will accumulate with a bunch of other stuff and pollution in some body of water because when it moves away, away is somewhere. We call it eutrophication when a body of water becomes overly enriched with all of these nutrients from runoff and that can cause excessive algae growth. And although algae growth seems like it would be a good idea, too much of it, you know, can create a blocking of light penetrance through the bottom of the river system. And we'll get into more detail about how uh, eutrophication can um, impact living things in water systems.